Greetings everyone, welcome to my first video in a new series that I've been wanting to try out for a little while. New to my channel that is, not new to YouTube I'm sure. Instead of making in-depth reviews, I'd like to try and smash out some quick thoughts on whatever I watch per week. And uh, I'll try to avoid spoilers if I can, but if I, if I feel the need to go into it I will give you fair warning, don't worry. Some films I will want to talk about more than others, but uh, you know, that's most likely because I think the less you know the better and that you should just go watch it yourself if you haven't already. Uh, this week just gone, I managed to watch seven films, two of which were rewatches of old films, and four were big hits from 2019. And then the last one was a total Marmite divisive film. Uh, I'll start with two classic films I watched. Shaun of the Dead. I must have watched Shaun of the Dead from start to finish a good, like, 15 times since it came out. But it had been a couple of years since I last watched it. And after taking a break from writing, I came into the living room to find my missus had just stuck it on uh, while she was having lunch, and we ended up watching the whole thing. I swear there's like 30 films in my life that I will always say, yeah, that's in my top 10 favourite ever, that. But Shaun of the Dead, I'm sure, actually makes a list every time. To this day, every single joke lands for me, and not just lands, cracks me the fuck up. A lot of people have their classic comedies that, like, you know, f never fails to give them joy and uh, laughter, you know, like Airplane, Big Lebowski, Holy Grail, stuff like that. But I think Shaun of the Dead might be that film for me, to be honest. I laugh as much now as I did on my first watch. I'm a huge Edgar Wright fan and Simon Pegg fan too, and, you know, I love all three entries into the Cornetto trilogy. Yes, even The World's End, which is equally as masterfully crafted as the other two, if not just quite, if, you know, just not quite as funny as but it's, it's, fuck, yeah, World's End's amazing. Anyway, uh, Shaun of the Dead is absolutely immaculate. Nothing is wasted. There's layers and layers of detail and references from the in-your-face to the background blink and miss. The acting and line deliveries are top-notch and the editing is phenomenal. Wright's use of quick, almost action movie style editing of the mundane tasks has become, you know, legendary and it's well-deserved. This film also gets really gory and extremely touching in the right places. Uh, yeah, I don't know really what else to say about Shaun of the Dead that hasn't been said a thousand times before. If, if Shaun of the Dead isn't a 10 out of 10 movie, I really don't know what is. An American Tale. The other film I rewatched for the first time in years was An American Tale. Once again, my missus just stuck it on and we watched it through to the end and had a lovely cry together. A beautiful, beautiful movie full of heart and hope. The 80s had some absolutely banging animated movies, and this one is definitely up there with my favourites. It's a very simple yet unforgettable tale of a lost child trying to find his family. It has four legendary songs that we sang along to, the hilarious and inspiring No Cats in America, the encouraging Never Say Never, the cheerful and uplifting a duo, a duo. Damn, that's catchy. And one of the best, most heart-wrenching songs ever written for the screen, in my opinion, Somewhere Out There. I want to have kids just to show them this movie. I swear, like, I still love the old-school animation style, and the voice acting is great. One of my favourite films when I was a kid, and still one of my top animated films, even now. It's just so pure of heart and rewarding. What a classic. Now, I've managed to finally cross off some of 2019's most acclaimed movies, starting with Midsummer. Now, I'd heard the, all the praise this movie was getting, and I would have been pumped for it had I not uh, thought Hereditary was one, was one of the most overhyped horror films of the decade. Well made and brilliantly acted, yes, but utterly predictable post a little girl's death. And then I also watched the first minute of the Critical Drinkers Midsummer review before it got into spoiler territory, and I thought. Yeah, it probably is just one of those pretentious nonsense, you know, once again, isn't it? But, you know, then I actually watched the film and then watched more of his review and that's why you shouldn't watch reviews for stuff you haven't seen, especially from cynical YouTubers like The Drinker, who I'm not trying to insult at all. I watch almost all of his videos and he is wickedly entertaining in a sea of boring voices. I just... I've just come to realise I personally don't think he's a great critic of film, to be honest. I, uh, I mean, he wasn't completely wrong, but he did call this film Directionlist, which it certainly bloody wasn't. Anyway, so I've finally watched this damn movie I've heard so much about, and for the first hour I thought, yeah, this is, this is pretty great, actually. <laughs> and then by hour two I was like, gosh, okay, just, just fucking get it over with already, man. God, rip the band-aid off. Uh, we all know what's going to happen, at least I did, but there was a, a glimmer of hope, you know, a spark inside me, if you will, that the film was going to pull the rug out from under me and actually surprise me with an interesting twist. 
And then by the end of the film, I was just like, for fuck's sake, it's hereditary all over again, isn't it? Uh, you know, I don't, I didn't really like it, but it's not a bad film at all. In fact, it's a very well-made film. It's, you know, it's beautifully shot with great use of long takes. For example, the one where her mushroom trip goes bad, and I also like the less than subtle, so the less subtle than most would use distortion effects when characters are drugged up. That was, that was interesting. I'm sure the score was good. Uh, I liked the track Fire Temple, but honestly, I can't remember most of it already. Whereas, say, It Chapter Two's soundtrack is still in my head. Florence Pugh was excellent, and she's definitely going places. Jack Raynor was uh, good as well, minus his awful accent. I did like the cultists too, although I'm not sure how many of them were actually actors, but they felt more to me like they were just locals, and that, that gave the film uh, a bigger sense of authenticity. Uh, the story was finally coherent, and did, at least for the most part, stick to its own logic. One of the problems with watching horror movies, well, all movies and TV really, especially ones with situations similar to the one in Midsummer, is that the audience, uh, myself, always, you know, we almost always tend to berate the characters for not making the choice that we would make if we were in their place. And while I hate the classic tropes, like, you know, the car won't start or taking too long to fondle with the fucking keys when being pursued, uh, I'm proud to have grown out of that mindset. You know, just because you disagree with the character's choices or actions doesn't mean the movie is flawed, you know. However, towards the end, when most of the newcomers have disappeared inexplicably, and after experiencing weird-ass culture and rituals that include fucked-up paintings, celebrated suicides, and classic uh, don't-go-into-the-basement vibes, it's hard not to shout at the screen and say, have you never seen a fucking horror movie before? Before, you know, get the fuck out already, Jesus. But again, the movie does its best to combat this by having the cultists defend their actions or even address them before the outsiders do. So I can't say it's a flaw of the film, but it is an annoyance. Anyway, as coherent as the film might be, uh, it doesn't mean I thought it was good, you know. Spoiler warning, uh, mute the video temporarily. Five, four, three, two, one. The final twist, which I put quotation marks around, uh, that Danny smiles and finally feels at home and loved by the family. You know, she so desperately needed and has finally found is perfectly set up and logical. It's just not nearly as interesting or as impactful as the film seems to think it is, you know. You've made me spend two and a half hours building to the most predictable friggin' ending only to slightly adjust it and act like you've blown my mind. No, you didn't blow my mind, you've just annoyed me further. And I've seen this ending before anyway, you know, I've done so much better in Robert Eggers' masterful The Witch, and you know, that had so much more impact and was far more haunting and satisfying to me. Like it's still I still think about that shit, dude. Would you like to live deliciously? Like I thought that's that shit's awesome, dude. You know, perhaps I've just seen too many horror films in my time and I'm way too hard to impress, but like I need to be shocked, surprised, and scared in order for me to consider it great, and this did neither, absolutely neither. And yes, Midsummer is a horror movie. It might be classier and well-made and requires you to actually think a little and take in the film in order to uh, understand the ending, but it is definitely a horror movie. A breakup horror movie, say, that's that's fine. Um, which I will conceive is an interesting premise, and the majority is, uh, you know, it's well executed, but over overall I finished the film bored and disappointed. In fact, disappointed is an understatement. I was flat out pissed off, you know, and I couldn't help but think, what a waste. But, you know, I'll, I'll give Ari Aster one more go because he definitely has something about him. He's got a good vision and, um, you know, I'm not really sure what that is yet or whether I care for it. But, yeah, I'll give him another go. I'll give him one more film. And if it's just, if it's just like Hereditary Midsummer, then fuck it. I'm, I'm not doing it again. Jojo Rabbit. I love Taika Waititi films. He's one of my favourite directors from the last decade for sure, and I just I couldn't wait for this next one. Yeah, figuratively speaking, I'm I'm a very patient consumer. Now I will say first and foremost that I I personally have an av an aversion to war films in my adulthood, particularly World War II films. I'm just not interested in, in them anymore. You know, I've I personally don't need to be reminded how bad it was on a yearly basis. It just feels like propaganda at this point. I'm not pro-fascism, or and nor am I against uh, a war is bad message, but I haven't needed to be reminded of how bad war is since I watched Splatoon in my teens, you know. And when Hollywood is constantly jamming agendas down your throat and you're aware of it, it just, you tend to want to abstain from it, you know, so. And in case you're thinking of me as ignorant or insensitive, know firstly that I'm talking strictly about my taste in movies, and not only that, my granddad was a Marine in World War II, and my family traces back only like three generations ago to Bavarian Jews. It's just a personal taste in movies I'm talking about, okay? 
Anyway, having opined all that, when something special and original comes along, I'm willing to put aside my disinclination in order to enjoy it and enjoy this amazing movie. I did. Where to even start? The costume design, production design, set dressing were all fantastic. To see Germany portrayed in such a colourful light was really refreshing, as you know, that's what it was like back then. The Germans were super trendy, uh, and yet it also helped add to the slightly fantastical element of the film. The use of legendary pop songs like the Beatles covered in German not only had Taika Waititi written all over it uh, and was a neat way of helping us relate to the mood while also taking us to another place but also paralleled Beatles mania with the love of the Fuhrer and that was really interesting. Uh, his blend of tone once again is perfect. He is able to go from touching and sad to cracking me up and then back to touching again without ever losing stride. You know something Boy and Wilder people uh, did extremely well but to be honest Thor Ragnarok not so much in my opinion. How Joker won an award for casting over a film like this is beyond me. The kids in this film were astonishingly good, particularly the two leads. Newcomer Roman Griffin Davis, I think his name is, carries the whole film as Jojo, despite having some serious heavyweights around him, nailing the brainwashed child who slowly comes to terms with his innocence. Uh, you know, what an excellent find. And then the terrific Thomasin McKenzie, she's already going places, having starred alongside Ben Foster in the under the radar hit Leave No Trace and uh, she's a lead in uh, Edgar Wright's next film this year, this horror film he's doing, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, not to mention the lovable and the scene stealing Archie Yates who reminded me a lot of a young Nick Frost. Anyway, uh, Tiger is superb at getting the best of young talent as he has shown us quite a few times now. Uh, and then those heavyweights I mentioned were also on form. Sam Rockwell is one of the best around, he is, he is always a win. Uh, I really loved him, his and Alfie Allen's unspoken relationship, it added so much humanity to his character and by the end I think everyone will be surprised uh, to be left feeling proud and sad for a Nazi officer which you don't really get in films. Uh, but the unrivaled standout for me has to be Scarlett Johansson, she was absolutely enthralling, by far my favourite role and performance she's ever done. Like, oh my gosh, honestly, I was in total awe of her, awe of her, she's like a dream man, she has all the energy and expression of a cartoon, yet keeps herself grounded in reality with an unmatched grace, she's just fantastic, give her a fucking award ready. And uh, Rebel Wilson and Stephen Merchant were also very welcome in the film. Uh, and of course, uh, can't not talk about uh, talk about it, uh, Taika Waititi as the imaginary Hitler himself. If he fucked this up, it could have brought the whole film down in my opinion. Uh, he too is quite cartoonish, but in a way that feels less like making fun of the man. I mean, it is a little bit, but it's, it feels less like that and more accurately what a 10 year old's imaginary friend version of Hitler would be. Uh, he was hilarious throughout, but when the moment came for him to up the game, deliver something closer to the unlikability that we have all come to know, he delivers the fury and bile so well, it pushes you back into your seat, or at least it did for me. Uh, I applaud you, sir. Jojo Rabbit had me in tears of laughter and tears of sorrow, and those are my favourite kind of films. This is definitely my top 10 of 2019. I would say all the doors are open, truly open to Taika now, uh, which we should all be grateful for, but I still hope that he stays true to his roots and doesn't abandon indie slash Kiwi cinema for bigger pictures. But uh, yeah, more Taika Waititi films, please. The Farewell. This film had me in absolute bits. From the first scene to the last, I was fighting back my tears. Uh, the premise alone is crazy to think about and a custom I'd never heard of and I'm still wondering if it's a good or bad thing and whether I could actually go through, it, through with it myself. I love the mix of Eastern and Western culture and themes. Uh, Lulu Wang is definitely a director to look out for. I can't wait to see what she does next. The farewell was so personal and yet completely relatable. Uh, Alex Weston's soundtrack, I have to talk about that. It's definitely one of my personal favourites from recent memory. Asian cinema scores always tend to hit me the hardest for some reason. I'm not too sure why. They, the use of strings just grabbed me. But uh, the cover songs are, are tearjerkers too. The voices of Elena Boyton, Michael Kilgore and Frido Viola and, uh, excuse me if I'm butchering his name, He Sang Park are gorgeous. And I love that Lulu Wang, the director, played the piano for the cover of Caro Mio Ben, a song that is a declaration of sorrow and pain and represents the film's emotional core. Absolutely beautiful. Go listen to it if you haven't seen, even if you haven't seen the film. It's only like 25 minutes long, the whole soundtrack. It's fantastic. Uh, Aquafina, or Aquafina, I'm not sure you actually say her name. She was fantastic. Uh, the best I've ever seen from her. Uh, the whole cast was, to be honest, but I have to give props to the lady who played Nine Nine, the grandma. She was just so delightful, and immediately you understand why everyone loves her so much and are so willing to go through this crazy plan. 
The film is beautifully shot and edited, not too fast, not too slow, uh, and sometimes uses a person, a personal favourite uh, editing slash narrative technique of mine, in which a conversation happens, like one conversation happens over multiple locations and shots. Uh, the farewell took me on a journey with it and made me suffer the same burden as the rest of the family were, you know, making me feel like I was part of the family and I was also, you know, in on the secret. The family dynamic was great and I loved how they clearly had a lot to say to each other after so many years, yet they kept it together in order to perpetuate the facade. Uh, to be honest, I need to watch it again because I didn't pay as much as much attention to the filmmaking techniques as I would have liked to. I was just so swept away by the story. It was It was just so beautiful and tragic. You know, as I said, I was fighting back tears all the way through, but then during the wedding scene when the oldest son gives his speech oh my gosh i was actually bawling and i loved it uh, i don't want to say too much more about this just that if you love films that are pure of heart and you know like me you enjoy a good cry watch this film immediately it is fantastic i think i watched the farewell about eight hours after jojo rabbit i watched them both the same day uh, and this also made my current top 10 of 2019 go watch it uncut gems there had been a lot of hype around this film and many talks of Oscar buzz and snubs and uh, I loved Good Time for its energy and for introducing me to the real talent of Robert Patterson. I mean, I love him as an actor now. Like, I've taken back every insult I ever heard about him from the Twilight days. You know, I have a first class ticket on the R Patch train, baby, and I was super excited to see what these brothers did next. Uh, Adam Sandler is at a career best here for sure. I'm not quite sure if I'd give him an Oscar or even an Oscar nom for it, but he is definitely up there of his best with... Um, What's it called? Uh, Punch Drunk Love. His unique charisma and the director's uh, boiling pot sensibilities are a great mix. Uh, I mean, the guy's like pushing 50 and he, he showed he still has uh, a you know, his tremendous amount of energy. He still has and it, it was put to use in a, a whole new way. His character is a total dickhead, really. But yeah, I was constantly on his side. I wanted him to win, you know, to get away with it, to sell off his opal and get paid and then relax and pay off his debt. But bloody hell, he doesn't make it easy on himself or, or me, the viewer. The rest of the actors are all great, too, particularly uh, particularly newcomer Julia Fox as Sandler's mistress. She was fantastic, totally lovable, totally hateable. You know, she just made me want to fucking hate fuck her so bad. After the prologue, the film really gets going and it grabs you and it just doesn't let go. Uh, it's an utter tour de force of anxiety building pressure to the point where it's just flat out uncomfortable and yet I couldn't take my eyes away. The film sparsely gives you a break but when it does I was so thankful for the breathing room. But even then I was on edge and thinking shit, 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 this is going to kick off again any second isn't it? It just doesn't stop. The camera movement and editing were as ecstatic as the dialogue and pace. Like constantly, I was just thinking, my gosh, just shut up and let the other person speak. You know, it's absolutely manic. Uh, the scenes in which people actually take it in turns to talk to each other are a rare breath of fresh air. Like 95% of the film, there's always something going on the other side of the room. People are constantly talking over each other. And at first, that might be a little jarring, but if you go with it like I did, uh, I think you'll be rewarded. You know, I don't really want to say too much about the film. Just know that I thought everything about it was on point and I recommend just watching it. It's it's on Netflix now, so if you're still a subscriber to the Degeneracy, eh, Degeneracy channel, which Netflix is, then go check it out. Uh, while I do still prefer Good Time, Uncut Gems definitely delivered. Uh, for good or bad, you're definitely in for an experience. Uh, and that ending, fuck, unforgettable. The Beach Bum. The last film I watched of the week was a particularly divisive film. I remember seeing the trailer for the movie like a while ago and I was thinking, you know, I thought, meh, I'll probably give it a miss. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll download it sometime, I don't know. But then I saw it, it was quite high on the list of best films of the year. Uh, and albeit, you know, pretentious as fuck movie list. But, you know, this it put this way above the likes of Parasite. So I was like, you know, uh, I've definitely got to check it out now. Uh, anyway, it was only about 90 minutes long, so I thought, fuck it, I'll check it out and just, we'll see how McConaughey, McConaughey can really be, you know. Uh, and the reviews weren't wrong, this this is the role he was born for, you know, right up there with Russ Cole from True Detective. Uh, now, I understand this film is not going to be for everyone, like, not at all, uh, and I've seen a shitload of hate and one-star reviews for it, but it was definitely up my alley. I fucking loved it. Moondog is one of the most lovable, charismatic and inspiring characters I've ever seen put to screen. There's a few times when, you know, he might go over the limit, but, you know, overall he's just he's just the absolute male fantasy come to life, but like a different version from like, you know, your Captain America or whatever. I, I pride myself on being a stress-free and laid-back guy, but oh my gosh, Moondog only sees the good things in life, you know. Despite being ridiculously rich, he chooses to slum it out. 
You know, his captivating personality allows him to mix with millionaire rappers and homeless crackheads just as easy, you know. Such a hippie kind of character would be so easy to turn into a cynical asshole, but he never complains about anything. Uh, you know, he takes each life-changing event in his stride. Uh, there is only once, I think, towards the end of the film uh, that he expresses any such kind of uh, cynicism. And even then he says it in a way that isn't wholly insulting to anyone. He's just like, you know, that's their life snap for me, man. Uh, the techniques that director Harmony, Cor uh, I think Harmony Corrine, I believe, uh, uses to take us on the journey with Moondog are very varied and interesting. As I've said before, I love the editing technique in which characters will have, you know, they'll have one single conversation that is then intercut over multiple locations and shots. Uh, and Corrine uses it to such excess in this film. I, I loved it, but it might put people off for sure. Um, you know, it, to me, it wasn't just a stylistic choice, but a method of conveying to the audience what such a lifetime hardcore stoner's memory would feel like and letting them experience, experience it themselves alongside him. I loved how the camera was never still and always seemed to be floating about just as Moondog does. And the soundtrack is brilliant. One of my favorites of 2019 up there with The Farewell. Uh, the soundtrack includes songs by Wailing Jennings, Peggy Lee, Van Morrison, as well as classic and new original songs by Snoop Dogg and Jimmy Buffett, of all people, uh, who both act in the film too. And then John Debney, Debney's uh, original score is excellent, particularly Moondog and Minnie's theme. I absolutely love it. I've listened to it so much in the last like day or two. Uh, instantly, it lifts me up without saying anything, and it lets me know how these two characters feel about each other without putting words to it. You know, every song choice uh, was perfect in its moment and really put me in the same mood and mindset as Moondog. Uh, Jimmy Buffett plays himself, and while Snoop basically plays you know, fictional, a fictionalised version of himself, there is also some small but unforgettable characters uh, slash performances by Martin Lawrence, Zac Efron, Isla Fisher, uh, and most notably Jonah Hill, who stole every scene for me. That ridiculous accent and some of his lines absolutely killed me. Motherfucker, my phone was dead. I had a funeral for that motherfucker. <laughs> I had a great, great time watching this movie. It was one of the most enjoyable and unique experiences I've had in a long time. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be honest, it definitely makes my top 10 of 2019 fucking fight me. So that's what I watched this week. Uh, what do you think of these films? If you've seen, if you've seen them, uh, do you agree, disagree? What do you recommend I add to my watch list? You know, new or old, I'm always uh, looking for great films. I mean, my, to be honest, my watch list is just so fucking long already at the moment. You know, please let me know. It'll be nice to hear from you, and I'll see you next time.